thanks everybody. Really short, I'm gonna keep it really short with a few um, words so that we have some terminology to start this conversation because the point that we wanna make is that um, it would be great if we had sort of an initiative at the university to, to just increase AI literacy in our community. And then we can transfer that to our teaching um, in terms of pedagogy, content and curriculum. And uh, so title, there it is, it moved, great. Um, so this is a definition, I looked at a uh, lot of definitions of artificial intelligence. This one is I like, let me read it out in case you don't see it. Artificial intelligence is the science and engineering of making computers behave or do things in ways that until recently we thought required human intelligence. I like this, uh, I put the uh, origin of that reference there, because in this definition of AI, we acknowledge that we previously thought that human intelligence was required in many tasks that we now offload to machines. Now we emphasize that computers are in this definition, we also emphasize that computers are different from humans and artificial intelligence, big air quotes, is somewhat of a misnomer because computers are not really intelligent. They're not really smart, despite the product descriptions out there. And if you see a definition in the media of AI as big air quote, the simulation of human intelligence by computers, you or that it develops computer systems that can think or learn or act like humans, then take it, take that with a healthy dose of skepticism. Uh, because these are really metaphors, they are analogies, they have been useful for the computer scientists to gain a lot of funding and all sorts of things, but, and they're of course preferred by the popular science uh, headlines because they're clickbait, but they're really unhelpful and exaggerated. The quote unquote awesome thinking machine, which is a phrase that goes all the way back to IBM and the beginning of Watson and all of that, is a myth. Um, any suggestion that machines are thinking or becoming human-like should be avoided. That's why I like this definition of artificial intelligence. Things that we thought previously that required human intelligence and we now figure that we can actually offload to machines. Um, so, and um, the key idea behind AI uh, is that machines can be designed to mimic in some way or reproduce certain cognitive abil abilities of humans. And that is correct to say perception, for example, reasoning or decision making, but without necessarily being human like in their overall intelligence. And this is where we have to be careful, uh, mind the hype, I should have said, <laughs> instead of mind the bots there, because there's a lot of um, uh, information out there that leads you to think otherwise. And by the way, this text was generated by ChatGPT and it's not that bad. Um, and I want to clarify when, what we mean by perception here in AI that includes computer vision, uh, for example, with applications such as uh, image recognition, path planning, face recognition, when you go to the airport and so on, vehicle um, um, uh, route planning and object detection and so on. These things and these systems are already deployed broadly in our society. When we talk about reasoning in the context of AI, we really use it in a very limited sense, in the sense of drawing inferences, drawing inferences from data. And AI capabilities are mostly limited to those types of database and statistical inference. True reasoning involves more than that, of course, and all of those other types of reasoning um, are still a challenge for AI. And by the way, this uh, weird looking images that are illustrating my slides are all artificially generated by DALI, another product uh, of OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT. So they're artificial <laughs> illustrations and I've placed the prompts at the bottom of the image to show you what generated uh, what, what I used. Very, very rudimentary prompt uh, prompts that I used to generate these images. People that actually do these images um, uh, properly and get really nice results are actually iterating with their prompts and editing and improving on those images quite a lot. So there's a lot of human computer uh, uh, partnership and uh, interaction there to generate those beautiful images that you see in the media. These are just a one, you know, one, one shot uh, attempt. So um, many times you will read some definitions of machine learning that say something to the effect of a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. This is all over the place. It's not correct. It even made it to public law um, last year. 
in the uh, appropriations uh, bill. It's in some page and I tweeted about it a few days ago when I found it. It's not correct because computers are indeed explicitly programmed. They implement an algorithm that optimizes a function that finds some parameters that uh, implements a model or otherwise solves some specific mathematical problem or a database problem. They're specifically programmed to do that. There's nothing mysterious about it. So I like this definition better. Machine learning is concerned with the programming of a digital computer to behave in a way which, if done by humans or animals, would be described as involving the process of learning. So we're not saying that machines are learning. They're not really learning. That is a metaphor. It's a metaphor that was adopted by the computer scientists to just, you know, to uh, uh, for marketing reasons or, or for or entertainment or aesthetic reasons, because metaphors are neat for us humans but they're somewhat unhelpful for people outside the computer science uh, world when they say the model learns and it relearns and reinforcement learning, all of those words that you see thrown around, they're kind of un unhelpful and confusing. Um, but it really what it is, is the machine is doing something that if we did it, we would uh, 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 characterize that as learning, but the machine is doing it through an algorithm that is finding, fitting a function, finding parameters, doing something that we can actually write in equations somewhat. Um, there's some degrees to which um, the new algorithms, algorithms in machine learning are um, adaptive, let's say. There is adaptive nature, but they're not learning, really. It's just a metaphor. Um, now, a word that is also relevant in this context is generative AI. You will see this thrown around. Generative AI has produced, uh, there's been billions of dollars uh, in the recent years poured into uh, generative AI, and it's going to bring an incredible amount of new products and uh, services into our society. Generative AI um, is a branch of AI that is focused on creating new content, such as text, in the case of ChatGPT, that is. Images, in the case of DALI, that is an image generation product. The images that illustrate my slides were generated uh, synthetically like that with a simple prompt. Uh, video and audio are also coming. I'm not quite sure what the level of the uh, development. Uh, the idea is that the AI um, is, is trained uh, on a large data set, and then that is used to generate some new unique content. Um, uh, the models are training huge amounts of data, and then they are able to output this new synthetic content, and it is unique. So, um, of course, this content will not be detected by the uh, well-known plagiarism uh, uh, tools because it's not it's unique, um, and it is just consistent with patterns that have been present in the data that it was trained on. And one interesting thing about this technology is that these pre-trained models that use generative AI can also be fine-tuned. You'll see this language as when fine-tuned, fine-tuned for specific content domains using some new smaller set of data, and that makes them very powerful um, um, and, and in certain settings. They can be used for automatic translation and uh, various various applications, and you will be all, all be uh, already used to a rudimentary uh, form of that when you have um, uh, automatic completion in your phone. And I send a message to my sisters very often saying, hello, my dear assistants, good morning, how are you feeling today? Now I just need to type hello in that specific thread and sisters is recommended to me, how are you doing to me? One by one, I just go tap, 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 send. Don't you, uh, don't you love that? Okay, that's a very rudimentary form, but you see it's not just the words, there's context. The model is able to see context. These generative models are able to see context. That's why they're so good at translation because it's not just word by word translation. It is the whole sentence embedded in a context that looks for that same uh, type of, well, it's really translated into vectors and so on. It's like there's mathematics behind it for producing a, a coherent translation into a new language. This is going to change everything, generative AI. And last uh, is the large language models. Large language models, LLMs, are um, a, a type of generative AI. They are neural networks that are trained on very large um, uh, data sets of text, such as books, articles, and websites. For chat GPT, I think the amount of text material that was used to train it is in the order of half a terabyte or a little bit more than half a terabyte. So it's probably the whole hard drive of your laptop over there. Um, and, um, and so it's a large amount of text. 
And um, uh, the goal is to obtain a model that can not only analyze text, but generate natural language output. Um, and uh, after training on those massive amounts of text data, they can be fine tuned. Again, fine tuning is a specific technical step that can allow you to uh, specialize a large language model to a given setting or to a given task, such as language translation, question answering, or text summarization. Example of large language models, uh, uh, Ryan already mentioned GPT-3 by OpenAI. OpenAI is a company started as a nonprofit, but it, it, it is a company now receiving uh, billions of dollars of investment from Microsoft. Microsoft has announced that ChatGPT-3 will be in the Bing search uh, browser this quarter, probably. So this is coming to search very soon. And um, there are many other models. This has hit the, the, you know, the media now, but there's Bird by Google. These are all news. There's many, there's at least two dozen other language models available either in-house at Google, at Meta and other companies or open source, but just not that famous because for whatever reason, um, uh, they, they don't have the same features that make ChatGPT uh, so um, catch everybody's attention. That particular feature, the particular features that make ChatGPT capture everyone's attention are that they made the interface completely transparent. Technologies that succeed are those that are invisible. Somebody said, like, and the, uh, Steve Jobs adopted that, but it wasn't him that said it for the first time. And it, this is the case with ChatGPT. Also, GPT-3 and similar large language, large language models are what people call in this field stateless. Stateless meaning you give it a prompt, it gives you an output, then you give it another prompt, it gives you another output, but each one is independent. Chat GPT has memory, again metaphor, in this sense that it is recording all of your previous prompts and outputs and it's giving the next output on the basis of all of that context. And so it has in that sense, it allows you to have that interactive conversational um, uh, behavior. Also, another thing that is not mentioned very much is that to get ChatGPT to be so so um, so useful in its replies, they had a process of fine tuning or reinforcement afterwards, where they had a dozens and dozens of people, contractors that were hired to rate the outputs, you know, to try it out, give the output, the, the output a thumbs up or thumbs down or improve on the outputs to, to, um, to just improve it. So there's a lot of human in the loop to create the final product. And um, some limitations of large language models are the following. Lack of context. They are trained on very, very large of data sets. So they may miss, miss the context of certain specific questions that you ask or prompts that you make. This can lead to, lead to the incorrect outputs that we sometimes see. They have no domain knowledge, so the training data is broad and may not be sufficient in very specific domains. So you have a very specific um, uh, area of study, it will not be able to, to give you a correct answer. That leads to irrelevant sometimes or inaccurate uh, output. Lack of creativity. If the output can be just average. If you ask it to write a paragraph, it'll just be bland. Um, although you can improve on that by giving it concrete direction about style. You can say, give me the answer in the style of uh, rapper uh, something, something, and it'll imi uh, imitate that if, it has, if it's present in the training set. Um, bias, of course, uh, it contains all of the biases that exist in the training data, there those persist in the model. Technical limitations, currently it takes huge amounts of computation to get one of these models. And so they are very expensive to run. And of course these limitations are being worked on. So all of these things are going to change very quickly. And, and this is the end of my uh, presentation. Of course, uh, that the uses of these models in education should be accompanied by proper monitoring and guidance from the teacher. And of course we have concerns about um, you know, possible uh, violations of certain uh, integrity, like students passing some of the output of a language model as their own work. Of course, we need to talk to students about these policies and guidelines and develop and adapt our syllabus, uh, like Ryan wrote about uh, to this situation. But um, there are also some opportunities that we could think about in writing. We can use that to, pro to, to provide feedback to the students on grammar and, st and style. Instead of us sitting in front of the student and actually analyzing their first draft, they could be working with uh, the conversational agent to do some of that work um, independently in a personalized way, um, uh, by the way. 
there's uh, engagement possibilities. You can use it to create interactive experiences because the conversational nature of the interface is actually very engaging. Uh, so it's up to our creativity to, cre to, to come up with simulations and settings where our students can use uh, uh, the conversational agent. Personalization, the idea of follow your own adventure. Um, you can personalize learning um, uh, uh, assignments or materials to groups of students and um, uh, use the um, the, the tool for that. Accessibility, of course, students with language barriers, the students that are, are not native English speakers can benefit quite a lot from these types of tools. Students with learning dis disabilities or attention problems can also benefit if we learn how to use them effectively. And test practice, you know how hard it is to generate good questions. Like I could actually have one question that tests one type of concept and I could say to ChatGPT, generate for me 12 questions that are similar but different to this example and it will do that for you and then you can have you can do it again and you can have uh 24 and then you can have one different question per students or 24 questions on the same topic for one student and so that uh, multiple possibilities for helping our job as well uh, in terms of generating more learning materials so by looking at this, by doing this, the benefits really outweigh the negative, uh, in my opinion, and could really be valuable for education. But um, as uh, Ray Schroeder said today in Inside Higher Education, quote, our learners, as they pursue careers, will do so in an AI-rich environment. Um, so paraphrasing now, we need to ensure that our learners have experience with the technologies as well as develop effective practices for their optimal use. And that is it. I'm going to leave with two quotes. Actually, I picked this up from Terence Tao. If you don't know, Terence Tao, field medalist, world famous mathematician. He posted this on Mastodon a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago. AI tools like ChatGPT will soon be capable of answering a large fraction of traditional university homework type questions with reasonable accuracy. In the long term, it seems futile to fight against this. Perhaps what we as lecturers need to do is to move to an open books, open AI mode of examination, where we give the students full access to AI tools, but ask them more challenging questions, both to teach the material and also to teach the students how best to use the AI tools of the future. And finally, I have another quote by, if I click the arrow and it works, <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. It's another quote from Twitter. Uh, and again, it's just my computer being slow. Um, and I'll stop there. The quote will be visible on Zoom in a moment when my computer wakes up. Thank you ever so much. <laughs>